Hello everyone and welcome to the Trinity Long Room Hub online for our first Fellow in Focus conversation of the new academic year. I'm Eve Patton, I'm Director of the Trinity Long Room Hub uh, and it gives me real pleasure to say that we have visiting research fellows back in the building with us finally after the long hiatus that was the lockdown. Uh, the visiting research program that we run is absolutely essential to the research profile of the hub. Uh, and just to give you a bit of background, every year the hub hosts several uh, eminent researchers uh, from uh, uh, across the globe to join us and to work with colleagues in our partner schools and with the library in Trinity on uh, cutting edge research. Uh, so we're very privileged to have this community of, uh, of eminent researchers working with us every year. Uh, Today's Fellow in Focus uh, conversation will touch on two themes that are particularly close to the Hub's interests and indeed to all of our interests in uh, the faculty. One is language, including language in translation, how it works, what it means in cultural terms, what it means indeed in environmental and ecological terms. And the other is Europe, uh, how does Ireland see itself in relation to the greater mass that is Europe and its political and cultural systems uh, and how has this operated through the 20th century. Um, our fellow in focus who will be talking today is Aidan O'Malley and Aidan is professor in English at the University of Rijeka in Croatia. He's an expert in translation uh, and in Irish cultural history um, his current book project has the wonderful title, Being Irish in English. Uh, so we'll be hearing more about that. Uh, but Aidan has worked across the fields of language translation and Irish literary and cultural history for many years now. Uh, and for me, uh, having worked with him quite closely, he's opened up very significant and complex questions about how the field of Irish studies and Ireland more generally can be seen in relation to European culture, and that's Europe both West and East. So I'm delighted to welcome Aidan to the Long Room Hub and uh, to listen to him today. Aidan's going to be in conversation with uh, Michael Cronin, who many of you will know. Michael is the 1776 Professor of French at Trinity and also the director of our wonderful Centre for Literary and uh, Cultural Translation in Trinity. He has written widely and published widely in the fields of language, translation, uh, Europe and indeed ecology uh, and how these things relate. And very much like Aidan, he is, I think, a, a brilliant theorist himself, but also a very imaginative picker out of the, the, the theorists and thinkers who are at the vanguard of our current intellectual discussions and narratives. And again, I've learned so much from listening to Michael um, in, uh, in all of his talks and lectures and look forward very much to hearing him in conversation today with Aidan O'Malley. So Michael, over to you and welcome. Um, thank you very much, um, Eve, for that very, very uh, kind, uh, introduction to uh, both of our uh, speakers. Um, just to uh, say there's a slight problem here. I'm just wondering. Uh, um, yes, I'm sorry about that. There was just a, a slight technical uh, glitch. So um, I would just like to thank um, Eve for those very, very kind words uh, of introduction. And also say just how delighted uh, I am uh, to be in conversation with somebody whose work um, I've followed for a number of years now and I found um, inspirational, uh, provocative, uh, questioning in, in all kinds of, of valuable and, and positive ways. And I think um, it's fair to say that, that for me at any rate, um, that Aidan O'Malley is one of the uh, single most interesting thinkers uh, on the, the question of what happens when one shifts from one language to another, one culture to, to another, uh, and how and what way uh, Ireland uh, fits into 
the broader uh, European uh, picture. But I wanted to begin, um, Aidan, with um, a book that, and I think this year we're kind of celebrating its, its 10th uh, anniversary uh, field day and the translation of Irish identity. So I know you 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 did um, your undergraduate work here in English uh, in Trinity. Then you went to do uh, an MA uh, in European Studies uh, in in UCD, and then went to do uh, your doctoral work at the European University in in Florence. And sort of out of that doctoral work, then uh, came uh, this particular uh, volume. And I suppose if the first question I, I wanted to to ask you was. Um, how did or, or why uh, translation as a way of looking at or investigating uh, Irish identity through the prism uh, of uh, Fielder's work? Um, thank you very much, Michael. And thank you both Michael and Eve for um, ridiculously generous um, introductions. Um, and it's quite an honor to be chatting with you, Michael, um, particularly about this topic um, and because Part of the answer to this question indeed is your own work, um, but I'll sort of retrace the steps uh, um, a little bit. As you said, I started here as a um, as an undergraduate and doing a pure English degree and then went away from academia for a while um, and was living elsewhere um, in London, but also in Rome teaching English. And so partly that, that experience, that very sort of actual experience of just being abroad and you know, having to learn another language and what happens in that process um, made me think about this. Um, and But uh, I reached a certain point in life where I thought, well, I need to get a better career than this, frankly. And um, but also I was looking, I was beginning to think, what can I do with English degree that might bring it more into contact with this, uh, with, say, the social world, with the world, you know, how, 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 does, uh, how does literature interact with the world, to, to, to very, very, very broad terms. Um, and I thought of looking uh, at European studies as, as sort of you know, moving into an interdisciplinary uh, frame. And um, the, this was the, the European Studies program that was being run by Bridget Laffin in UCD appealed, and I came back from Rome to um, to take that. And the, there, I was introduced to various different ways of thinking about uh, European identity for political, political sciences, um, his, historical, and, and you know, I, I, I was you know, it was good to broaden one's perspective, but I was constantly sort of brought back towards literature itself, because I, I suppose the, the thing that I was thinking about, broadly speaking, was European identity, whatever that may mean, um, and notions of identity. And I found some of the discussions of identity in, in, in say, disciplines such as political science and quantitative political science problematic. Um, it, it's you know, count the flags was sort of, I've, I've literally seen that in a paper um, uh, you know, to tell you how much national identity there may or may not be in, uh, in areas. And for me, identity is always an imaginative process. And it's, a, it's, it's something that you imagine yourself to be in, and you imagine yourself to be that in conversation, in dialogue of some of different forms with others. Um, and it was that sort of process of being of coming back to do the MA thesis um, and thinking about what I might want to do with that and how can I bring these concerns together that brought me to translation and I have to say particularly your, your book on uh, Ireland and translation began to do, you've mapped out a, a route which you could use a process um, of thinking about translation as I said translation in some respects for me has always been a way of mapping how literature does interact with the world. It gives you some evidence. You have you have real evidence there. You know, the people have had a poem and made it into another poem this this way. So we can then begin to analyze the cultural influences and ideas that, that are informing that cultural aesthetic um, and other influences. There's a sort of a body of evidence there, and this is what sort of brought me to notions of translation. And then out of that. I ended up at Field Day really because I applied to go to Florence um, with a more broader um, perspective and I was accepted on a, on, a, on a broader notion of translation and European identity. Um, but when I was doing the MA thesis that summer before going, um, I started, you know, I looked at translations, obviously the play, and then started to unfold Field Day and thought, well, this offers a really good neat case study and I think a really important one. Um, so that that be, then became the project going forward and I brought that project to Florence. Um, 
So it, it, it works. To be, that, that was the kind of thinking and the, and, and the process. And Aidan, you know, in looking at field day, was the primary preoccupation there um, beginning to explore the, you know, the, the, the theme that's continued to, to be um, core to your work, um, kind of worrying that question about, you know, what it is to be Irish in, in English, that um, it's, you know, it's something that you know, plays out in institutional settings where, you know, Irish studies can often be subordinate to a larger uh, British and American studies department or, or the, 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 the very question that, you know, gets repeated in, in, in Irish cultural discourse around the, the, the different status of the, of the national languages and so on. I mean, it, it, did, did you feel that, that, that Field Day was particularly useful as a kind of a deep investigation of, of, of that problematic of the, of the cultural shift, language shift and so on? Well, absolutely, I mean, because you also had a very particular political context in, in, in which this was operating. Field Day wasn't, a, you know, was, was explicitly a cultural intervention into the troubles. That's why it was formed. It's a, and, and it's quite interesting then to look at a, uh, something that is a cultural intervention into the troubles that basically hardly touches on the troubles directly. You know, uh, you, what are the, instead they're looking, you know, starting with translations, which was of course the, uh, the only impulse behind uh, the creation of Field Day was to produce this one play set in 1833 um, and looking at um, the issues of language and seeing that in some respects that it does come down to language all the time. Um, but it's, you know, that play does set the agenda for both, I think, for Field Day's work very largely, uh, but also for my work. Um, it, it's, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't avoid any of the issues that are is sort of, sort of uh, around the, um, around the issue of Irish and English, but it's, it's, it's very much, you know, what can you do about this? How, how, how do you think about it? It's, it's about the processes of writing that, that history. Thinking of thinking in 1980, how to write about 1833. Um, I think that's what feel they were particularly good at uh, as well. That these this discourse is a constantly changing, and that's what I found um, running through field days plays. That it's a, they're allowing. You know, I chose the title "Performing Contradictions" for that reason, um, allowing all the problematics of this um, to come out, to, to come out, and, and, and showing these. Uh, so it never it never devolves down. I felt in the in field day into a simple. Um, you know, there's the English on one side and the Irish on, on, on the other side. That's why I use titles like being Irish in English. It's a, you, you have to live with that contradiction. Uh, you have to find ways um, of um, of expressing yourself. You know, it's, it's the you at the end of translations. This is our new home now. You know, we have to make it into our home. So you're, you're muted. Mm -hmm. There is one particular image that's um, kind of stuck with me from that, that book or a kind of concept, um, which is uh, a notion of the importance of, of treachery or, or, or treason, because we often have this kind of figure that recurs in Irish history, that, that of the, uh, the, 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 the traitor. Um, and, uh, and of course, this is one thing that the translators are often accused of being this, this kind of traditori, uh, traditori, you know, so the, the, the translator traitor. So, but you kind of uh, valorize that positively and you say that, in fact, the, the figure of betrayal, the figure of the, 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 the traitor, somebody um, who either betrays king and country or you know, betrays the, the nation, uh, is an important figure. It's, it's a, it's, this is the figure that sort of creates another sort of space and mm -hmm. this, you know, various uh, hegemonic uh, practices. Uh, do you want to say a bit more about that, um, Aidan? Well, um, yeah, the, the translator, you know, the traditore, traditore um, notion, uh, which you know, Venuti has critiqued recently in that uh, uh, book, um, is, uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a useful one in Ireland. You know, the, the, there is that long tradition of, you know, all Irish revolutions have been undone by the traitor, um, but the traitor is, of course, somebody who has a foot in both worlds. That's that's the uh, that's how you can be a traitor. So you, the, the necessity and the, of of being a traitor um, is is what translation to an extent brings out like, traitor in that broader broad sense of the word, um, not a, not necessarily to be a political traitor. Um, but there's also within field 
you know, and when I was looking, I, I broke, as you know, the, in, in the book, I, I break it up into these kind of metaphors of translation to an extent. Um, and I think about translation in a sort of, you know, the, the, this uh, re recently, but um, you know, translation is a metaphorical act. It's, a, it, you know, it, it is literally the act of bringing from one side to the other. Um, and the, I think there's some powerful metaphors such as hospitality, such as uh, traitors and loyalty. Um, and within that, I felt, one of the things I found interesting was some of the plays such as Double Cross, which is, there it is, it's written into the play, in Kilroy's play, Double, Double, Double Cross, it's about traitor, it's about betrayal, it's about political betrayal, um, looking at Brendan Bracken and um, William Joyce, Lord Haw Haw, uh, but tracking their sort of lives, where you see that, in fact, an ex for both of those, an excess of fidelity brings about a betrayal, um, which is, again, I think a very interesting sort of a, a notion as well. A betrayal, a, a rather more negative betrayal, that if you're too loyal to something and you know, um, William Joyce's um, life, you, you can trace him as being too loyal to the notion of the British Empire, to a very sort of, you know, this is what, and he, he thinks he's being betrayed by it but when the, uh, with the War of Independence in Ireland, uh, brought up as Unionist in Galway, um, and then goes off to London and is searching for that real Britishness, which he finds in Oswald Mosley. Um, and then you know, when, when, when Britain enters the war with Germany, he ends up, he ends up going to Germany because he thinks that's where real Britishness is, can be recuperated as true Hitler. And on the other hand, you have Brendan Bracken, who has you know, just led one of the most remarkable careers of any Irishman. Um, and uh, I think those plays were very, you know, they're probing notions and there's no, you know, just as you know, traditori, traditori is, is a problematic you know, notion. Um, it, but it's important, I think, to, it, as long as they're seen as keeping things fluid. You know, you, uh, I think one of the most important things about translation is that it's never done, it always has to be redone. I think that's, that's at the, the heart of the ethics of this, uh, of, of translation. Um, and I think the, the plays gestured in certain ways towards the fact that identity is never done as well. It's, all, it, it, it's, it's, it's a constant dialogue. It, it never ends up being a solid thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that just the, that notion of, of excessive nationalism, which becomes a form of betrayal. I mean, this is something that's got to run right through, for example, biblical translation from St. Jerome to, to Luther and, and words is that, you know, uh, excessive literalism to, to the, the, the source ultimately ends up in, in a, a profound form of betrayal, you know, in, in terms of what the, um, if I could sort of, you know, a, a, affect a kind of, you know, a translation or translatio in, in a, a, a geographical uh, sense, uh, Aidan, and um, sort of move uh, closer to the, the, the part of the world um, where you, uh, you, you, you teach and, 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 and profess. Um, and it's kind of central and, and, and Eastern Europe. And I'm, I'm thinking of the, the, the collection of, of essays that you uh, edited with the uh, director uh, of the London Hub, uh, Eve Patton, Ireland West to East, uh, Irish Cultural uh, Interactions, Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, because, you know, when, when we talk about Europe, um, uh, you know, in, in Irish discourse, it's, it's often a very kind of truncated kind of, of, of Europe. It, it, it tends to be, um, in some ways, um, a Europe that, that follows the, 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 the contours uh, of the, uh, the Cold War division uh, of, of, of Europe. And of course, there are the Honourable, there's the Olivia Mannings, there's the Hubert Butlers, the Rebecca Wests, or recently Paul Durkin going home to Russia, Michael Locke and Stalingrad, a, st a street dictionary, uh, Heaney's uh, translations of Ranchek. But it's, uh, one still gets the impression that um, it's that Irish views of Europe tend to be predominantly fixated on 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 on, on, on the Western half of that. Um, I mean, do, do you feel that intensely from, from you know where, where you, you you normally teach and, and, and profess that there's this very partially truncated view of the European experience? Well, yes, um, I you know, that that has been the. You know, history of our Irish engagements with Europe, which is what I'm working on at the moment, where you, there is this kind of notion that when Sean O'Fallon and others talk about Europe, you know, the, Italy is kind of a boundary to uh, the Western boundary of that, but you know, it's kind of Paris of all this. It's, uh, you know, Paris is always the, the, the shorthand and, you know, Pascal Casanova and others often make it seem like that as well from, from the Parisian centre. Um, but 
Um, in terms of you know, working on the other flank of Europe, um, you know, in, in, in Croatia, you realize that the Croatians think kind of similarly about it as well. Um, you know, the, when you're on, on the periphery of Europe, the, the, you know, there is another Europe. Europe is so always somewhere else to an extent um, as well. And, uh, and I think that dynamic is, is, is quite interesting. Um, and you know, it's, it's kind of informing what I'm thinking about at the moment. You know, for the for Croatians, perhaps Germany plays a much bigger role than France would do for the for Irish um, discourse. I, I, I would argue, but um, but yes, there there is that sense um, that you know, within our within Ireland um, that we don't. How do we engage with Eastern Europe, um, Central and Eastern Europe? And that's more correct. And I've just written a piece. Um, which I was struggling with for, for a bit about um, Irish non-translations, non but translations of um, Central and Eastern European drama. You know, Friel's work, for instance, in Three Sisters, which I talked about looking at um, Field Day, but I was, and uh, there's quite a few ex examples of this. Um, you know, translations that are actually just from English versions. They're not. So how are you? How are we engaging in the, in some respects as a culture with Eastern European um, with this Eastern European culture? And again, I find that translation becomes a very interesting way of of looking at this. Um, you know, the, my argument was with Friel and also I was looking at Jeff Flann O'Brien's work on um, the the Chapek brothers' plays, um, on the insect play, which he makes into Rhapsody in Stephen's Green, completely. Domesticates it. It has nothing to do with um, with the original, very or very little. Um, but he makes it into a discussion about language. Actually, there's a there's a language battle that happens in in, um, in Act Three of that, and it's between Northern um, Unionists and Southern Un and Southern ants um, who are both you know, who are trying to make the the, the Northerners speak Latin, you know, which itself resonates right to today. Uh, you know that they were because. The northern ants are saying we're not going to speak this language. Um, it, it does have a resonance, but you know, at the same time, he's really uh, operating. He's Irishifying British English, and as is to a, to a large extent, Friel. You know that the, you know, when Friel is writing Three Sisters, he's looking at uh, you know, the fact that uh, Chekhov has been largely taken over by the British stage, and, and that he's framed as sort of all of you. Know, he, he talks in these particular tones about a, a gentle de decline that the British are sort of seeing in the 20th century, and he's going to make it more Irish. And that he, but so where, where is the translational interaction really focused? Is it between Ireland and Britain, or is it between Ireland and these other, uh, these supposedly other countries of, of their origins? And I think that tells us something about Irish engagements with Eastern Europe uh, to, to an extent. Um, you know, language is at the heart of it. Um, Justin Quinn wrote of the room. Where would you, do you think the kind of figure of dissidents fit, fit into this? Because it seems to me that one of the, you know, the, uh, Terence Brown wrote a kind of interesting article about this, I think it was 1991, about you know, the, 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 the figure of, 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 of dissidents that, that for a, a number of Irish kind of writers that were uh, felt that were kind of pushing against particular kind of hegemonic forces, you know, whether it be sort of imperialist, nationalist, religious, and so on, um, that they felt a, a kind of a, a common feeling, you know, you know, whether this was kind of misunderstood, misunderstood misconstrued, but in a certain sense of fellow feeling um, with dissident writers and uh, intellectuals in Central and, and, and Eastern Europe. Do you, do you th think there was a kind of, some kind of tentative parallelism being set up there? Well, you know, the, there was the, the Heaney piece in particular. Heaney was, I suppose, the most notable. Um, and you know, where he talks about this is the essay called it, The Impact of Translation, and, you know, that, that, that he's getting these translated versions. Um, uh, and again, it, it, it allowed Heaney this sort of freedom to um, use as he's, you know, for images and phrases that he wouldn't have used otherwise, as he's admitted. You know, a lot of that, you know, the hope and history, um, old really is inspired. As he said, it was inspired by what happened in 89 in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And the language of it, that sort of, that, that exuberance, which I think he would have, you know, he, he could perhaps 
perhaps a little bit embarrassed by uh, afterwards, um, kind of came out of that. And you could even relate it back to the Milwash poem that, um, that, that he cites in Cantation at the start of the impact of translation. You can, there, there are notes right, you know, that, that are quite clearly to, to be heard in the choral ode in, um, in the Cure of Troy. But uh, you, I know you were you wrote a piece um, in the journal I edited as well about uh, about updating that that notion of um, dissidence and, and how you, you argued yourself how you know, um, you should be revisited and that's actually what we might need now. So I was wondering what you might have thought of uh, you know, that yourself, actually, Michael. Yeah, well, I suppose I mean, one of the things that sort of interests me about uh, the work of the, the, the Czech philosopher uh, was uh, precisely the way in which he, he negotiated or kind of thought again, you know, about the uh, practical relationship between, you know, tradition and modernity, these kind of these polarities um, and the notions of uh, notion of conscience. So, so taking a kind of a, a concept that was uh, that are all kinds of of, of religious connotations that was, was seen as somewhat kind of tainted uh, in the in the Irish lexicon and then but 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 taking it to do something else with it you know to, to um, and uh, and it's, it struck me it was that somebody like uh, Patochka that the particular conditions that he's working in in, in in the Czech Republic but you know with a, a smaller nation and so on that there was, there was kind of interesting um, philosophical potential capacity there um, that um, for you know uh, Irish writers and, and thinkers in a way that uh, might not be the case in, in, in thinkers for from, from large metropolitan nations with the different concerns and, 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 and preoccupations. And I was just wondering in in, in, in that connection, um, Aidan, one of the things that you say in, in your, your your recent contribution to the um, Cambridge volumes, you, you talk about Europe. For, for the Irish is a kind of a sort of a, a ghostly uh, floating signifier. It's, it's this thing that's that, that's out there, um, which kind of uh, resists definition for the very good reason uh, that, that it can be used for basically anything you want it to, 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 to mean. Um, do you want to say a bit more about that? In, in, in what sense do you, do you mean that? Well, this is the, the, the project, I suppose, that I'm working on at the moment here. Um, and, you know, which hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll turn into a book um, in the not too distant future. Um, it's thinking about the, the, you know, how, how Europe has been mobilized um, as a concept in Irish discourse since uh, 1940. Maybe, I, I, that date is uh, partly to, to do with work with, uh, the Second World War, partly to do with the creation of the Bell, but it's also to get um, you know, to be post Joyce as well, because I hear that Joyce would overshadow almost everything. Um, in, uh, with this, but it, you, with the but to start there because I think the, the bell does and of Whalon helps to really create this and sort of crystallize the notions that are probably going on in the 1920s and 30s through Yeats and Joyce to to, to an extent. How do how do we uh, when we invoke Europe? What are we talking about? Um, and it's usually as a form of critique of Ireland. It's somehow that there's this other place. You know, it's now not Britain. You know, it, it, and Britain was always far too pro problematic because of the, the colonial relationship you, 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 but you could form a, a comparison with this Europe, which is never a specified Europe. Um, and Ophelia you know, did this throughout the bell, really. Um, it, it, there's, a, there's a constant sort of nod towards, wow, look, look at us, we haven't, we haven't got this. The best critique of, of Ophelia that I've ever that I have encountered is actually Flann O'Brien, who is co constantly taking the mickey out of this. Um, he, you know, Sean of Wales, they're talking with his Scandinavian friends and sort of they're all rolling the rise about uh, Irish backwardness in, 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 a, in a variety of different forms. But in fact, I think that discourse is, you, you can find that you know, well beyond of Wales and right through the, the revisionist nationalist discourse. You know, Europe was always kind of there in the background. And again, it was built in the 1970s and 80s. Something that you, one should do, one should be more European, but what was that Europeanness? Uh, was it some sort of vague substitution for British civilization that we now must co-opt? Or, but then again, was the, 
this might also be um, a problematic uh, one. Is, is it, and you know, by Foster voiced some fears that it was just going to be simply a way of you know, getting around England and forgetting about the English inheritance as well. Um, so it's constantly contested. Um, and uh, you, you know, it's you know, my project at the moment is, is to try and trace some of these discursive um, uh, arrangements and ways of thinking about Europe, thinking about also you know, who's saying it in Ireland, but what, what Europe are they talking to? Uh, are they talking about West or East uh, and classically? Um, that's, and, and that's an interesting divide in, 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 in terms of the Cold War politics that are going on as well. Um, um, and you brought our writers from the north talking about Europe in, in, in differently to, to writers from the south. Um, and then you do get people like Heaney and you know, even John Hewitt who's out in Yugoslavia, they're, they're embracing it. You know, Hewitt in particular is embracing, I, I think, you, uh, you, Europe in, in a different way. Um, and uh, so the, the Catholic Europe as well. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> I was just wondering, I mean, is it basically um, to do with some version of kind of modernization thesis, because I mean, it's, it's, uh, the thing struck me recently reading an extract from uh, I think Matul's new book, um, where he, he mixes kind of personal memoir and then kind of the, the larger history of the last 30 years in Ireland, um, is that um, it, a complete obsession with the notion of a sort of Hegelian historical movement uh, towards the, 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 the modern, that the, you know, there's a, the, this kind of telos uh, in, in, and there are set, setbacks along the way, but there is, there, there is the kind of the, um, the, the, the modernist Valhalla uh, there on, 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 on the mountain. Way. And is, is, is Europe then sort of, is, is, so you, you get a, a contrast between this kind of advanced project of European modernity uh, and then the kind of primeval dark uh, murk in, in, in which the, the Irish are submerged before they kind of they're, they're, they're brought onto this European stage. I mean, is, do you think that dichotomy or binaries still still has a, a shelf life, as it, it seems in some ways? I think it has, surprisingly enough, actually, because um, you, I think by tracking this over a certain period of time, um, you know, you, you can see, as I said, of well, I'm starting precisely with this argument, you know, uh, that Europe is the modernity that Ireland has not yet achieved. That's, that's so simply what you, Europe I think stands for um, to a large extent there, but then you know there are engagements with Europe, and um, I was reading a, an interview which uh, John Banville, who I think is, is, would be would, would be a very you know, definite example of this kind of argument in the nineteen um, eighties and nineties, where he was talking about how you know as a young writer he was rejecting all of the Irish writers such as uh, you know Behan and uh, Flann O'Brien and all that they were all parochial. He was he wanted to embrace Europe um, and. He, he admitted it sounded pretentious. Um, but then, he, as he was talking in this interview, which was conducted a few years ago, he said, well, you, you discover that Europe is actually parochial itself. You know, it's a, that, that you, 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 when you actually start to encounter Europe, you know, it's, it's not that different elsewhere as well. So you would think that that sort of broader engagement with Europe um, you know, would defeat that, um, that discursive sort of notion that uh, Europe is the uh, modern, but, but it's, it, 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 it still sticks there. And you could particularly think that Europe has come to Ireland you know, with immigration, um, but that that might um, sort of disrupt this, uh, this discourse. But it's... I have a feeling it hasn't, to be quite honest with you. That, uh, it, it, it largely hasn't. Yeah, no, no, I, mean, I think it's very interesting that, that uh, point about the, the extent to which, you know, we, we sometimes in Ireland become you know, uh, extremely skilled in the business of, of self promotion and self, but this is often coupled with an extraordinary lack of curiosity in the, in the cultures and, and, and languages of others that, that, that come to our, our shores. and. That's one of the things that, that really needs a lot of, of, of work is, is the development of greater reciprocity in, in those, uh, those uh, understandings. I'm just wondering, uh, uh, to what extent um, is the question of uh, Europe, um, both historically and the present, um, bound up with, 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 with notions of social class? Because you know, on, on the one hand, you know, as, as you described in your Cambridge chapter, um, there is the... the, the the, the, the sort of the, the, the French 
uh, convent school uh, in, in, in Limerick, the land of spices, Kate O'Brien, there were French is associated with um, a kind of middle class, of middle class way of, 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 of being, of, of, of speaking, of eating, of behaving, and, 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 and so on. So that um, the identification with Europe or version of Europe becomes an important kind of marker of, of social distinction and class. So that, that, that is, that's kind of one to do. Then the other, which is the um, is working class activism in, in, in Ireland, the, the Republican Congress, George Gilmore in 1936, where uh, European political philosophies uh, are constantly throughout the century uh, feeding into the radical activism uh, of, the, of, of the Irish left and, 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 and working class movements. Um, I mean, do, do, do you see that kind of, those two things, not very, or is one very hegemonic and, and the other is a kind of peripheral uh, existence on the margins? Well, I think in my work, I've been focusing on the middle class one because I think that's the one that finds more literary expression I've, uh, that, that, that I've been uh, look, look, looking at, uh, um, particularly with the Kate O'Brien um, notion of this kind of forming a, a post-colonial um, sort of Catholic um, middle class and, uh, you know, and what are the values that, uh, that might uh, attain to that. You know, the, the, Again, to sort of bring it back to the personal a little bit, you know, over the past while I've been emptying my parents' house and came across a whole set of photographs of my grandfather, my, my paternal grandfather, um, from the 1920s up to the 50s or 60s. Um, not every year, but they were all group photographs from Lourdes. Um, they, was, and you realise that this was this was the middle class of Ireland on holiday. It's you, you, you and this sort of there were many different nationalities in these photographs. This is a way of encountering otherness as well. Um, but it was also, you, you, you went on pilgrimage um, uh, instead of going to, well, I suppose, you know, Benetton for, uh, for, for, the, for the British in, 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 from the 1970s onwards. And I think that's, that's something that this kind of, you know, that creation to a, to a large extent of, of a kind of an Irish liberalism um, is what I've been focusing on. I haven't been looking at uh, yes, really at the at, at, at the left wing tradition. Um, it, it's you know, it, it's I'm, I'm not too sure where it finds literary expression. It can be some sort of a you know, flaherty to, to to an extent, but it's uh, but it's really sort of. You know, um, uh, I think that it's the, you know, the middle class are always the, the dominant class to an extent, but, the, but they're often overlooked because they're just there um, and, and uh, people sort of are, are taking that as a, as a given. But, um, and I think the, particularly the, the way in which the middle class are defining themselves in relation to um, the, the colonial context, I mean, trying to get beyond it and find ways that, but also kind of linking it, because I think a three-way relationship in some ways Britain becomes, you know, it's kind of shifted towards, or Europe is kind of shifted towards Europe, as it, towards, excuse me, towards Britain, um, that they're sort of seen as being, you know, a successor sort of civilizing force within Irish culture, um, but one that now uh, is more amenable to um, a post-colonial state, that it, because it, it is, you, know, you can find the Catholic resources there that uh, and, 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 and create them. Um, and I think you know, when you get then towards Cranebag and that, you, you begin to see how that kid takes on a philosophical sort of uh, molding as well. Um, uh, that, that you, the, here we're, we're looking at you know, forces of Irish uh, liberalism coming into being, and they're look, do, doing it through Europe, um, you know, looking to European philosophers, and that, but not, not to greatly disrupt uh, in the same you know, in, in the way that you were talking about earlier, Michael, um, I think more to sort of say, well, you know, we, we can look towards reconciliation. We can look towards a sort of a, a, as a you know, as a sort of a. You know, it's not what Carney said, but it's kind of a fit province to an extent. It, 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 Europe kind of functions to an extent in the in, in the nineteen eighties as a potential fit province. This is where you know, we can find re re uh, resolutions, um, and uh, you know, to an extent, the Good Friday Agreement sort of uh, bore that out. Um, it, it becomes as Europe is, is one of the sites of which you know, uh, the Good Friday Agreement does, does rely on this uh, space, creating a space where identities could be otherwise. That's at the heart of the Good Friday Agreement, that you can be British or Irish or both. Um, it, it's, uh, and Europe is one of the sponsors of that. So you, could, you can sort of trace that politically as well. Um, uh, um, so yes, as I said, I, 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 my strong suspicion is that the um, 
that in terms of literature, it's a much more middle class discourse that, that's emerging out of uh, Europe. Yeah, I mean, it's just one, one uh, final, just quick um, question, uh, Aidan, and it's to do with um, the notion of, um, I think, what you might call continental identity as opposed to insular identity. Because one of the things, of course, that, that, that Brexit has sort of sharpened our, our consciousness awareness of is how insularity can play, play out in, in political terms, how you know, a, a particular can construe itself uh, as, 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 as island, an island that secedes from, whereas the Irish are in this um, situation where it's, it's you know, it's, it's the, the island that wants to be attached to the, to the continent. It's, it's a kind of conjoined one, this schismatic uh, relationship. Do, I mean, do you think that that notion of insert play, plays out in any way um, in, in terms of, you know, islandness as opposed to continental being because that is what would distinguish uh, um, you know many uh, ireland from for example many smaller nations in, in central and eastern europe mm. i haven't very much uh, i haven't really thought about it in terms in, in those terms to be quite honest with you michael um, uh, it's um, it's also a divided island, I suppose. That's part of uh, you. Know, I think the partition makes a difference uh, on the island, as we've seen with Brexit as well. Um, uh, you know, there's definitely a, a case that you know, the, the island is a, has a sort of a geographical sort of imaginary um, does have a does have an effect. But uh, but uh, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm not too sure. What do you think yourself, Michael, about that? You, you've been thinking more about. Uh, well, I'd like to just just. Very, very quickly. I mean, I, my feeling is that uh, I'm astonished how little self reflexivity there is about insularity in Ireland, about mm -hmm. how it to be uh, an island uh, nation. Um, it, it's just struck me in kind of reading um, recently on, 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 on French Polynesia uh, and how that notion of one thing that tends to characterize in, uh, insular identity is, is a deep rooted attachment to place because of the fragility of the island surrounded by the sea uh, that at any moment it can kind of potentially disappear uh, under the, uh, the water. Um, so there's that in in intense rootedness because of the sense of precariousness. But on the other hand, uh, you can't get off uh, the island quick enough um, that it, it becomes the island prison. It becomes the, the place of confinement. It's the, um, so, uh, you know, you, you jump into your uh, boat or you jump into your, your curragh or you go to Dublin airport and get off. So there's this profound ambivalence, uh, which is bound up with the kind of the, uh, the geographic condition of insularity that, that I, I think is, is, is ex extremely interesting. Just, you know, as one of the ways of thinking about, you know, how, how uh, Europe fits into the, 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 the Irish vision of things. But at this stage, um, you know, uh, Eve, I wonder, I, I'm having trouble access. Yes. I, I, I'm going to jump in, Michael, because I realise I uh, foolishly forgot to invite everyone at the beginning. Please submit questions or, or comments if you have them for Aidan uh, or Michael in the, the Q&A and we'll come to those. And while people are putting in some questions, Michael, um, I hope I can jump in because your, your discussion of uh, insularity has, uh, has prompted me to think about the other island, the Septed Isle, which is the kind of elephant in the room in much of your conversation. Uh, and I, I was thinking, Aidan, that you know, the, the time Friel was writing translations, of course, there's that great line about, sir, we, we overlooked your island from an Irishman to an Englishman. And Friel was writing at a time when English as a language was still carrying that baggage of high empire, hierarchy, uh, uh, colonial authority, and so on. I'm wondering what you both think about the status of English now as an intermediary language. Now, when we could see uh, a version of England, which is very much degraded from the 1980s, uh, it's, a, it's an Americanized English, it's a, a damaged English perhaps, and also of course, it's a post-Brexit English. Where does English sit in this field of vision that you're constructing uh, about Ireland and Europe? Well, I take that on. Um, I think that's absolutely key to what I'm thinking about, actually. Um, and it's sharpened by being in a place like Croatia. Um, you know, I will, if, if I say to my students that they're being 
phrase their English, they, they look at me as if I've just said, well, you, you've just told us that we can stand up straight. Um, you, you know, like it's, it's taken in that sort of level. It's, this is just a given. We, we, we speak English. Um, now, the, the, uh, what I find interesting is how our, Ireland has become, uh, you know, as, as it becomes more Europeanized, you know, we've had more Europe come to us. It has also become much more Anglophone. Um, we've it, I, I, you know, we've become or not not so much more Anglophone, uh, but we've become much more rooted and much more a, a, an important nodal point in the Anglosphere, um, and particularly in the uh, literary ang Anglosphere. You know, that you would work with, you know, as Pascal Casanova to an extent, sort of uh, uses us as, as an example. We, you know, writers throughout the 20th century really found their way of negotiating between largely, you know, Paris first, but then it becomes New York and London, um, and where it becomes a major player in this um, sphere. Um, and when I'm looking in, in, in Croatia and I'm, and I'm teaching there, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, English has become dissociated very largely from England, but very largely, but still it's there. It's 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 not it's not gone away either. It's it is the language of globalization, but it's yeah, but its history is always there. And my students are you know, the, the language. It's it's associated. They they do see it in a hierarchical framework, um, and you know there is. It's also when I was teaching English in Italy, and I would have students say, "Well, I don't want to speak American English. I want to speak British English." Like, English might be. Wanted the accent first. It, 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 it still has that resonance. It, it hasn't actually gotten gone away. So everyone needs to know English. And there is a there is a notion that the British English is, is richer and deeper than American English. The, the American English is more functional. Um, so I, I sort of when I teach something like translations, I'm saying, well, this is the process that we're looking at here. We're looking at this. You know, Translations is really mapping the start of uh, Irish modernity in some respects, indeed, the, the forced sort of uh, introduction of, of a form of modernity. And when I'm what I'm looking at in, in Europe, as people increasingly speak English and not their own language, you know, many of my students are, are have professed themselves to be happier speaking and writing in English than in Croatian, and we, we, we write, um, you know, you write creative, creatively in English, not 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 in, not in Croatian. You, know, you're, you can see that the, you know, a similar force is going on there. I, I suppose what's kind of interesting is that it, 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 it kind of cuts both ways. I mean, one thing that for yourself in Ireland, um, from, and you see this the late uh, 1980s onwards, where uh, on the one hand, there's this extraordinary entry of the, uh, the Irish into the kind of the triumphalist phase of the Anglosphere, which will kind of come to a bit of a shuddering halt in 2008 with, with austerity. But certainly there is this period, you know, where uh, Ireland shifts very much, you know, the, the, the famous Boston-Berlin binary, you know, it, it, it moves to Boston, it, it, it's in this sort of Anglo-American investment bubble. And so, and it, it very much um, strongly uh, championing uh, that. But that's also the period where you get spectacular growth in the Gwael Scholar, Gwael Chlashti, um, you get a kind of um, the, the the setting up of television uh, Gaeilge that becomes you know Chichi you know, So there's a so, so you, what you find then is this um, burgeoning of of of, of interest uh, in the in the Irish language, and it it it, it moves outside um, what was seen as the the, the kind of the, the, the very uh, inward looking uh, narrow ghetto which it, 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 which it was identified. Um, so, so you, you are getting that kind of um, centrifugal movement uh, in in the Anglosphere. Um, at the same time, as well as I, I think, um, what you're you're, you're getting, um, I think as you see this um, particularly in poetry, is um, a, a notion of of an English that's increasingly deterritorialized. Um, because you've only to look at the you know the the, the the Booker Prize winners to see you know from just how many parts uh, of this. Uh, English-speaking world that the, the, the writers are, are, are coming from. And so, of course, there is a kind of uh, that, that perception around British English and social class and, uh, and American English. But, but it, it seems to me that there, there are other forces that are at work in, in, English, in English itself. And, and I've been at, you know, I've worked in English for a very, very long time, which, which is, you know, I think some rush this thing about, you know, we're, we're all kind of translated beings now, you know, that we're, we're all living in a, a kind of, uh, state of, of, of translation. So it, it so that that uh, the, the, the fact of, of English, how it plays 
uh, out. Um, uh, it takes very many different configurations and shapes, I think. Uh, if, okay. I, I don't know if you can see the questions, Michael, but I know one has come in that's related to what you've just been saying. Uh, if we have time to, to take it from Lisa Foran, and uh, Lisa says that it's very interesting to hear about the association of French with middle class values, um, but that European political philosophy has had more of an impact on working class movements. Uh, and the question she asks is, is this down to the stifled education system that flourished after independence? Uh, that in fact more formal education in Ireland bred more conservatism. Um, Aidan, I wonder if that lends itself to a larger discussion. I know it's just starting before your 1940 uh, uh, starting point, but the question of whether um, a particular educational ethos in Ireland created particular routes to Europe or stopped particular routes to Europe in, in any interesting ways that, that you could reflect on. Well, I think it does come down to a matter of language to a large extent, and this is what, you, what I'm trying to sort of balance in this uh, project is to think between you, you about this sort of broader cultural and various other social historical um, interactions, but that how language is you know, is going to be a, a starting and perhaps a stopping point. Um, now, you know. I haven't been looking at the um, the, the educational uh, sort, of, sort of syllabi and how they developed, but um, we, we know that um, language teaching has, hasn't been high on the agenda. But, but, but the worst language teaching that I've ever encountered was in Irish, in fact, um, uh, and that, that sort of completely halted my um, knowledge of, of, of Irish. Um, I ended up with more French than Irish at the end of second year, uh, at the end of secondary school. Um, now. You know, languages are the are the way of opening up, and, and one of the things I am sort of thinking about, and uh, it's uh, if Polish is the second language in this country, how many people here speak Polish who aren't Polish, uh, and you know, has Polish had any uh, impact on the um, the syllabus in, in Ireland? I, I believe you can take exams in Polish, but does anyone do they teach Polish in, 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 here at, at the moment? I, I don't know the answer to 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 that. Um, I, uh, I, there is this instruction in Polish, yeah, and um, I mean the the Department of Education. It's 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 modern language strategy you know, for uh, the next uh, ten years. It's it's it wants to bring those new languages um, onto the the, the the curriculum, and it's there is a commitment there. I mean, how it will play out in practice remains to be seen, but um, to mother tongue. Uh, retention, an explicit commitment to that, which is unusual, to say mm -hmm. that for, for English-speaking countries, particularly countries like, like, like Canada, where, you know, generally the idea is the kind of melting pot model and, you know, um, whereas then, no, there, so there, there, there is, there is a, there's a, there's a shift in, 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 in that area around, around these, these um, but I just kind of wondered in, in, in response to Lisa's uh, question there was the, um, it's the kind of role of modern language departments, I suppose. I would say this, wouldn't I? Somebody in a, in a French department in Ireland, but I mean, we have had modern language departments for, um, you know, for in most of our, our universities for, um, for, for, for more than a, than, a, than a century. And it's so these, is it what modern language departments uh, is, is there, they're the, the kind of Europe with, with, within. Uh, the country itself. Um, so uh, I think it would be interesting questions to speculate as to what you know the, the role that they 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 played. Because if you look you know, uh, from, from Joyce and, and, and Beckett to uh, Deirdre Martin, um, Irish literature is full of modern language graduates, um, and you just you, you wonder then about the the, the influence of um, those departments, which were generally uh, relatively small. Uh, but seems as if some level had an influence that was completely disproportionate uh, to their 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 their, their size, um, and you know whether it wasn't the kind of not so much the fifth column, the fifth province is the fifth column <laughs> um, within uh, within our society, you know, uh, quietly you know undermining a particular particular piety. But anyway, it's just a, a, a kind of thought that was suggested by, by Lisa Ford's question. 
It is, and, I, and it, it brings me, I mean, we, we, we'll have to close shortly, but I think perhaps, Aidan, this is, you know, an unwritten story uh, in this continental connection that you're, you're tracing, you know, that the educational context, even if we think of Trinity, where, you know, we're all working at the moment, as having had that incredible status uh, as a center for European philology, literally, and, and then modern languages, and having obviously shaped what Beckett went on to do, and, and numerous other figures uh, that we've talked about, such as Walter Starkey, you know, unfortunate and fortunate, um, that that's the next part of the story, is to look at the cradle of European attachments in Ireland itself. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't know if that's something that you're, you're going to bring into the book, but... Um, I hadn't been thinking about it, um, because I've been thinking, as I said, along the lines of these journals, which are so sort of creating public debate um, uh, and then trying to get some authors around it. You know, I, you know, ultimately, I'm a literary uh, I'm a scholar, and you think, well, think there has to be chapters on authors that, 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 that focus on, on, on how they you know, think about and articulate and you know, problematize these notions. Um, but yes, it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a consideration as to how uh, that, that will be figured in. It's a, you're, you're quite right. You know, Always, uh, always good to bring things to a close with a mention of uh, of Samuel Beckett, of course. But um, but thank you both so much. I mean, I think that uh, obviously this discussion has not only ranged widely across the question of what Europe has meant, what Europe continues to mean, um, but has also reminded us about translation. Uh, not simply the old adage that translation is always a, a political act, but that uh, I think we can see from listening to you why. The culture of translation and the questions about translation um, that you've both addressed are right at the forefront of, of all the research dynamics we're pursuing at the moment uh, and connect to everything that we work in, in terms of identity and cultural narratives uh, and cultural and political history. Um, so I want to thank you both very much, Aidan and Michael, uh, for joining us today to have this conversation. Uh, and also, of course, to thank the team at the Trinity Long Room Hub who've put it together. Uh, and finally, to thank everyone who's taken up uh, lunchtime uh, and joined us. And I can see more questions and comments coming in uh, in the Q&A, which shows there is a huge interest in this topic. Um, we will be running more fellows in focus sessions and more faculty in fo focus sessions as the semester continues. So I hope people will join us again uh, for those, please keep an eye on the Trinity Long Room Hub website uh, for those events. And we look forward to seeing everyone again very soon. Thank you all very much and have a good afternoon.